There are times when you'll want to share a MixCraft project with someone. If the person you'd like to share with is also a MixCraft user, this is really easy. Just go to the File menu, scroll down to Copy File Projects 2, and choose Zip File. This will save all the necessary audio files, sounds, and samples to one handy compressed file. But if you're sharing the project with someone using different DAW software, they won't be able to open a MixCraft file. The solution is to give them raw audio files for every track in the MixCraft project, all beginning at bar 1, right there. In this way, they can open a new project in any DAW software on PC or Macintosh, set the tempo to the same tempo as the original MixCraft project, which you'll want to write down and tell them, and then they can create blank audio tracks and drop the audio files into their own project. The only problem with this approach is that it entails individually mixing down every track in a project. This can be kind of tedious for smaller projects on up to mind-numbingly tedious for larger projects. Fortunately, MixCraft aids mix down to stems function lets you skip all that madness and export all the project's tracks in one operation. It also lets you apply naming conventions that make it easy for the recipient to decipher what's what. And if you've ever received a project from a Pro Tools user with 26 files named guitar underscore backslash point 57 dot 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 take 63, you'll appreciate this feature. To use the mix down to stems function, you'll click file and mix down to stems. And over here, this dialog box that will ask if you want to save your project. And this is really just uh, a safety in case anything goes wrong. So it's usually a good idea to save the project here. Now this can look a little scary at first glance because there's a lot of stuff here, but it's actually really easy to use. So I'm just going to go through it bit by bit and explain what all this stuff is. Over here is the window that shows all the files that are going to get exported. In other words, this shows all the tracks in your project. Low kick one, low kick one, XST 307 loop, hats, so forth. And over here is a checkbox, and this just lets you select if it's going to render it or not. So in other words, by default, these are all checked so that when you hit mix, it's going to output every file in the song. But if there are files in the song that you know you're not going to use, then you can uncheck the box and it won't output files for them. So for example, in this particular project, I replaced the Nord bass over here with a Minimoog VA bass. So I don't want this Nord bass, so I can just click that guy right there. You might have noticed that this guy over here flashed when I unclicked that because these check all and check none buttons here will automatically select or unselect all of the selection boxes here. So if I hit check none, it turns off everything. If I hit check all, it turns them all on. You might have also noticed that the destination file here disappears. And this over here just tells you uh, where the file is going to land. That's your hard drive C, users, Mitchell, that's me, Dropbox so forth, and then finally the name of the actual file it's going to output. But we'll get to uh, the naming thing down here a little later. And then we've got some checkboxes over here, and these are pretty self-explanatory. The Mute Tracks checkbox over here will temporarily disable any insert effects you have on the channels. And this is a good idea if you're going to give something to someone to remix. Um, if you've got a bunch of insert effects like compressors or EQs or you know, chorus or flange, or whatever, uh, more than likely the person receiving the tracks to remix them will not want those effects. So instead of having to go into your mixer and bypass every single one of these effects, which would take a really long time on a big mix, you can just click this checkbox over here and they will all temporarily be disabled. Next we have set track volume to 0 dB and this just automatically sets all of your levels, either here or in the mixer, wherever you want to look. It puts all the faders at 0 dBs, because if you've got a mix of a song, and say for example you've got a percussion part that's super quiet, it's going to print out as audio at a super low level, which you don't want to do, because ideally you want all your audio files to be as close to 0 dB as possible for full dynamic range. And then if the person remixing it in their DAW wants to turn it way down, they can do it with their mixer. But this way they'll be getting an audio file with maximum signal noise ratio. Next we have set track pan to center, and again, same kind of thing where MixCraft is going to automatically put the panning in the middle, which again is useful so you don't end up with stereo audio files with blasting audio on one side and nothing at all on the other side because you've got it panned. Over here we have the ignore automation parameters, and this is uh, similar in concept to the audio options here. If we click this checkbox, volume pan and track lane automation is ignored. If we click this box, the effects automation is ignored and clicking the clip box will ignore clip-based automation. 
Yet again, if you're turning these tracks over to somebody else for remixing, you will absolutely want to click these checkboxes here because if the volume or panning is going nuts in the audio files that they get, they're going to be really unhappy. So check all these guys and they will get non-panning, non-volume automating tracks. Moving over to file info over here, we have standard settings for audio file format. And you can click this menu here and you can see we've got WAV and FLAC and MP3, AUG and WMA. Unless somebody's requested a specific file format, nine times out of 10, WAV is gonna be your best bet because WAVs can be read by just about any DAW, regardless of the computer or audio configuration. So WAV is always a good bet. Over here, you've got a settings button and this lets you specify things like sample rate and bit depth. But usually you'll be safe with 16-bit 44K audio. You might wanna do 24-bit because that's a little higher fidelity. To the right of this, we have stereo and mono buttons and these are kind of important. Under most circumstances, you'll want to just leave it in stereo because if you have stereo tracks in your project, you won't want them to turn into mono tracks when you click mono. The exception to this is if you want your vocals and kick drums or uh, bass guitar, things that you know are mono to come out as mono files. The best way to approach it if you want your mono tracks to stay mono files and your stereo tracks to stay stereo files would be to do two separate passes of mix down to stems. Uh, select mono, and then click all the things that you know are mono. I'm gonna check none here. And for example, I know my kick is mono. I know this loop happens to be mono. My bass is mono and so forth. Then I do a mix down and for example, I'd end up with three audio files here. And then let's say everything else was stereo. I would then check all and then uncheck those guys, set this back to stereo and do another mix down. But if you have any doubt, it really doesn't hurt anything to do everything in stereo. You just might end up with some audio files that are essentially dual mono stereo, which doesn't really hurt anything. It just makes the files a little bit larger. Next up, we have the file naming convention area. Now, one time I went to a file naming convention over at the local Moose Lodge, and boy, was that a hoot. But this isn't like that. This actually lets you specify how the files are going to be named when you output them. So uh, I'm gonna check all again so you can see all these names. And if you look over here, you can see where it says the drive and users Mitchell, that's the folder. And stems, that's the subfolder. And over here, you can actually see the full name for each one of these stems. And these are governed by this section over here. So if you look over here where it says tip, you can see there's all these things in brackets. And this over here is a guide to tell you what the bracketed variables will be. So in other words, I have this bracketed P over here, which is project name. And you can see my project name up here, which is MC8 underscore UNIV, export stems, etc. And you can see that's replicated over here. And then there's the word render, which I've typed in. Uh, I can change that to whatever. You can see it change up there. But I'm going to leave that render because this render works in conjunction with that number three over there which is mix ID number. And this is a number Mixcraft automatically assigns. Uh, that three is there because I've already rendered these out two other times. But if I rendered these and closed the window and did it again, Mixcraft would automatically increment this to four. So if you keep rendering new stems, Mixcraft automatically increments this little number so you won't confuse which set it was. Moving along, we have the track number. And here, again, you can change what you've typed there if you want. I could change that to song or whatever, but I'll leave that at track. And then we have the little bracketed number sign, which is the track number. And these track numbers correspond with one, two, three, four, and so forth. And then finally, we have the track name with this little N right here. So you can see like low kick one, low kick one, XST 307, XST 307, and so on. Feel free to experiment with the file naming convention section. You can really customize this and you can move around the variables to different spots if you want like so. Anyway, this is really easy to customize and it's a super convenient feature. Finally, at the bottom here, we have output folder and this simply tells you where the files are gonna end up. And you can change that by clicking right here in these three dots. And uh, right now, my output folder goes to my Dropbox, but if I wanted it somewhere else, like on the desktop, and now it says users Mitchell desktop, so it's gonna go to my desktop. Finally, we've got this little lonely guy down here, use timeline selection. Now, by default, Mixcraft is going to output the entire song. In other words, it's going to look for the very first audio clip and the very last audio clip, and it's going to output everything from start to finish in that area. But if I hit cancel over here, let's say I just wanted 
this area over here. Now I'm only gonna get all these tracks between bar nine and 53. So let's get back in there. And you can see now this isn't grayed out anymore. So now I can click on that. So now when I output my audio, it's gonna output all the tracks, but only between bars nine and 53. If you deselect this, it's gonna output from bar one to however far your audio clips go in your project. So let's try this. I'm gonna hit the mix button here. And you can see there's a progress bar over here. And if I grab the Windows directory that it's going into, you can see all this stuff is landing in here. You can see the progress bar is still going. And we're gonna do a video edit so you don't have to stare at the progress bar. All right, your files have been mixed down. Hit okay. And again, if we look in the Windows directory, there we go, there's everything. One other quick thing I wanna mention about export to stems, just to be clear, is that it will work on virtual instrument tracks as well as audio files. So for example, right here, I've got this Minimoog VA part right here. And if you look in here, you can see my Minimoog VA part got rendered as an audio file, just like all the other regular looking audio file files. Before I let you all go, I wanna talk about how export to stems handle send and submix tracks, which are these guys over here. So let's start with send tracks. If you look in my project here, you can see I've got a send track right here, which is adding some effects to my electric guitar. And if you look over here underneath the electric guitar, just like in the project itself, you can see the send track. And as long as you've got it checked, Mixcraft will create another audio file just for the send track. And this is really handy because, for example, here I've got the dry electric guitar, and then I've got a little bit of effect on the guitar. I believe it's an echo. The uh, echo only on the send will print on its own audio file. So if somebody else is gonna remix, they could just use the dry electric guitar track, or they could bring my effects in on another channel in their DAW. Now let's talk about submix tracks. Over here I've got a submix track and I've got my two acoustic guitars panned in stereo. And if we look at the window here, you can see there's a submix track here, which is that guy, and the acoustic tracks here and there. What's gonna happen when I render them is you're gonna get the submix track, which is essentially both of these guitars playing or anything that you have on the submix track all mixed together. And then you're gonna get the individual files as well. So you may or may not wanna give all three to somebody because it might confuse them. Uh, in my case, I would probably turn off the submix tracks. They would just get these acoustics on their own. Uh, but if you had a bunch of stuff blended together that you wanted to stay as one unit, like say a lot of tracks of backing vocals and you just wanted a stereo mix of that, you could hypothetically uncheck the individual elements and check the submix and then they'd only get the submix.